Today, we look at the fascinating and surprising history of how the dismal science got its name. Many people know that it was the writer, historian, and essayist Thomas Carlyle who coined the term the dismal science and applied it to economics in 1849. Many people also believe, however, that this had something to do with Malthus. Now, it's true that Malthus said that population grows exponentially, while the ability to grow food and to feed that population only grows, at best, linearly. As a result, Malthus said that starvation was the inevitable consequence. True, that's pretty dismal. It's not, however, why Carlyle called economics the dismal science. The reason Carlyle called economics dismal is, in fact, much more surprising and shocking. Let's take a look at the place where Carlyle first coins the term the dismal science. It's in an essay called An Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question. It's a little weird, so bear with me. It goes like this. Exeter Hall philanthropy is wonderful, and the social science which finds the secret of this universe in supply and demand and reduces the duty of human governors to that of letting men alone is also wonderful. He's being sarcastic. Not a gay science. No, a dreary, desolate, and indeed quite abject and distressing one. What we might call by way of eminence the dismal science. These two, Exeter Hall philanthropy and the dismal science, led by any sacred cause of black emancipation or the like, to fall in love and make a wedding of it, will give birth to progenies and prodigies, dark extensive moon calves, unnameable abortions, wide coiled monstrosities, such as the world has not seen hitherto. Now that's pretty strange. Now what does it all mean? So clearly Carlyle is saying that Exeter Hall philanthropy and the dismal science have united in the sacred cause of black emancipation, and Carlyle is against this. Let's take a closer look at exactly what Exeter Hall philanthropy is. We can understand the context a little bit better. So here is a picture of Exeter Hall, which in fact was a grand hall in which many important political speeches were given in London. And Wikipedia gives us this very important piece of additional information. The meetings of the Anti-Slavery Society were held there, and such were the significance of the political meetings that the phrase Exeter Hall became a synonym for the anti-slavery lobby. In fact, we can say a little bit more because this picture is actually a meeting of the Anti-Corn Law League, the group, the Anti-Corn Law League, which wanted free trade, which wanted lower tariffs. And in fact, not only did these two groups meet both in Exeter Hall, but there was a significant overlap in membership. The people who wanted free trade also typically wanted free labor. Those who were in favor of laissez-faire were also anti-slavery. Not always, but there was a confluence of these two groups. And it was this confluence, this overlap between these two groups, between Exeter Hall philanthropy and the dismal science, the free traders, that Carlyle was so, so against. Carlyle's political philosophy revolved around hero worship, worship of the better men, the great men, the superior men, around inequality, hierarchy, the benefits of feudalism, of putting people in their place, of everyone knowing their place and their role in society. He wanted, in fact, to reinstate serfdom and to reinstate slavery or serfdom for Africans. He really was, it's fair to say, a proto-fascist. And in fact, he was influential among the fascists, who of course came much later. He was joined by many others, such as his friend, art critic, John Ruskin. This is why Carlyle opposes the dismal science with the gay science. The gay science being the term at the time for poetry, for the arts. And in fact, it was among the poets, poets and the artists who you saw the worship of inequality, hierarchy, and the great men. Here's Ruskin uh, on his principles of political economy. If there be any one point insisted on throughout my works more frequently than another, that one point is the impossibility of equality. My continual aim has been to show the eternal superiority of some men to others, sometimes even of one man to all others, and to show also the advisability of appointing such persons or persons to guide, to lead, or on occasion even to compel and subdue their inferiors, according to their own better knowledge and wiser will. This, too, was 
Carlyle's philosophy. As a proponent of inequality ruled by superior men and serfdom, it wasn't surprising that Carlyle opposed organizations such as the Anti-Slavery Society. But why did he lump the society with the economists? The reason goes back to Adam Smith. In explaining why some countries are rich and other countries are poor, or why some people are rich and other people are poor, economists after Smith had focused not so much on innate differences in people, but rather on differences in constraints, differences in laws, differences in incentives, and so forth. So Adam Smith said, The difference of natural talents in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of. The difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. If you know the great movie Trading Places, it's really an illustration of Smith's argument. In this movie, a businessman and a bum trade places, and we see how well they do in their new professions. This movie, by the way, Trading Places, has also got a great lesson on the futures market, so check it out. Carlyle's main complaint about emancipation was that after they were freed from compulsion, the former slaves of the British West Indies no longer were so willing to do the back-breaking labor required to produce the sugar and spices which Carlyle said were necessary for British civilization. Instead, in Carlyle's words, the slaves just consumed, the former slaves just consumed leisure and they ate pumpkins all day. John Stuart Mill replied, replied angrily to Carlyle, who had once been his friend. He said that one could not call something civilized if it required slavery in order to keep it going. Moreover, he pointed out that the words of English writers of celebrity are words of power on the other side of the ocean. And the owners of human flesh, who probably thought they had not an honest man on their side, will welcome such an auxiliary. Circulated as his dissertation will probably be by those whose interests profit by it, from one end of the American Union to the other, I hardly know of an act by which one person could have done so much mischief. And I hold that by thus acting he has made himself an instrument of what an able writer and the inquirer justly calls a true work of the devil. Indeed, John Stuart Mill was correct. Carlyle's essay was widely circulated in the U.S. American South. So as you can see, the dismal science got its name because economists stood with members of the anti-slavery society in supporting freedom and equality. Not so dismal after all, something to be proud of. For further readings, do check out David Levy's pathbreaking book, How the Dismal Science Got Its Name. It's a great book, and I've drawn from it heavily here. You can also find a summary by Levy and Sandra Pert in The Secret History of the Dismal Science. You can find that online. The Thomas Carlyle and John Stuart Mill debate has been collected in a book, and you can also find both of their pieces online. Thanks very much.